Today's message begins with a story that my dad told me as I was growing up of a time when he was driving down the road. He was on the countryside and he noticed in the barbed wire fence there was a, a dog that was entangled. He was hung up in the fence and broken with compassion for this dog. My dad pulled over and approached the dog and in an attempt to free the dog, what do you think the dog did to him? It bit him. It bit him. And so he shot the dog. I'm kidding. He didn't shoot the dog. <laughs> that is one possible ending for this story. That's not what happened. He got bit. He got bit bad and it hurt. And, you know, he always told me growing up, isn't it crazy, you know, how a, a, an animal can misunderstand what you're trying to do. Even in a moment when you're really trying to help that animal, they think that you are intending harm. And so as a, as a measure of defense, you are the one that gets bit when, in fact, you were the one trying to help the dog. And you know, the, uh, the Israelites in Jesus' day, they were kind of like that dog in that Jesus was there on a mission to free them. The Israeli people, along with all of humanity, were entangled and needed to be rescued, needed to be freed. And that's the very reason why Jesus was there. It was to help them. But the second that the Israeli people recognized that Jesus wasn't rescuing them the way they thought they should have been rescued, they turned on him and they lashed out and they bit him. Now, before you get too judgy, you and I have done the very same thing. In moments where, as a believer, where you are going through a season, you're going through a situation, you have in your mind an idea of how you think this situation should turn out. You have an idea in your mind how God should respond to your situation. But so many times, God does not respond the way you want him to or the way you think he should when in fact what God is really doing at all times at all times God is working things together for your good but many times you don't see it you you your perception is off you don't see all the details behind the scenes you don't understand what god is really trying to do so instead you lash out you lash out god why didn't i get that promotion i have worked so hard i've put in my time at this company why didn't i get that raise why didn't i get that position why didn't i get that job that i applied for god i've been so faithful I've been at church every time the doors are open. Man, I'm, I'm returning 10% of my income to you, and this is how you repay me. God, why didn't you give me what I asked for? Why didn't you give me what I wanted? Does that sound familiar? Don't raise your hand. Don't do it. Don't do it. But let's all just be honest with ourselves. It sounds really familiar. God, you didn't do what I wanted you to do or what I thought you should have done in my moment where I needed you to do this. As pastors, so many times throughout the years, people have come, Pastor, will you, will, will, would you just pray that I get that job that I just applied for? And I'm thinking, I, I'm thinking, I never say this, but I'm thinking, man, I ain't a genie in a bottle. I mean, we're not making wishes here. You don't come to me making wishes. I, with a smile, and, and maybe I've done this to you before. <laughs> And with a smile, I'm going to say, I'm absolutely going to pray for you, for sure. Then when the prayer happens, it goes something like this. Father, you have a perfect and complete plan and will for this person. 
I pray that if that is not your will, that you slam the door shut so hard that they have no choice but to recognize this job was not you. And you had something better. And God, open up the door that you, that you meant to open so they can see it, so they can walk through it, so they can recognize that this whole time you've been working out all the details behind the scenes for their good. They just haven't seen it. In Jesus' name, amen. You don't, you don't know. You might have a plan, but God's purpose is so much better than your plan. So stop getting caught up in the details of the way you think it ought to be and recognize God has a plan and his plan is better. That's what this Palm Sunday message is all about. That's what Jesus being here on this earth was all about. He came to rescue. He came to free. He came to save. But not in the way that we thought or expected him to save us. So today's message is Rescue Mission. The title of this two-week Easter series is Unexpected. We realize what his mission is. He made it really clear to us in his word in Galatians. Chapter 1, verse 4, and it says, Jesus gave his life for our sins just as God our Father planned in order to what? Rescue us from what? This evil world. So therein lies the problem. We live in an evil world. That's the problem. The question is, why is it evil? See, the answer in Romans 5 and 12, it says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the entire human race. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone for everyone's sin. Now, we're not talking about just a physical death. We're also talking spiritual death, eternal separation from God. Here's what we all need to understand. God loves his people. He is crazy about you. He is crazy about humanity. So there was a problem. Sin entered the picture. Now, what is sin? Sin is anything that you and I say, anything we do, anything we think that displeases God or is contrary to the word of God. You can't change his standard. You can't change the moral law that he has written on the fabric of our hearts and within our soul. There is a standard. It is the holy word of God. It is God himself. He is the standard. We can't change that. We can't twist it. We can't manipulate it. It is his standard. And sin separates us from the relationship with God because we literally break the spiritual law or covenant that was made with God when God created humanity. Sin separates us. That was the problem. So when sin entered the world, the human race became contaminated with sin. And the world, as a result, became an evil world. In the garden, the world wasn't evil. It was after the fall of man. It was after sin entered the picture. But Jesus came as the solution to our sin problem. And that's what this Easter series is all about. You know what I think is amazing is when you study the word of God, you begin to see how God is so into the details. God loves details. And if you're not a detail-oriented person, like you've got to appreciate the fact that God established and laid everything out before he even created the world. I'm not sure if you knew this or not, but the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 1, verse 19, it says this, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect, he was chosen before, say before, before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last days for your sake. You see, God knew before he even created humanity, before he created Adam and Eve, and before he placed him there in the garden, God knew that we would not be able to live up to his standard. He wanted relationship. He wanted people that would love him, people that would love him by free will, not because he forced it upon them, but because they chose it. So he gives them these boundaries, these standards for their own good. 
And of course, we could trade places with Adam and Eve and any of us would have blown it. Why? Because God knew ahead of time that humanity would not be able to live up to that standard. So he prepared a plan ahead of time, a plan that was so detailed that it was going to take hundreds of years to completely execute. This morning, before we kind of dive into the New Testament and to the triumphal entry, which is what today is really all about, Palm Sunday, the beginning of the Passion Week, the beginning of the most important week in human history. You can't really dive into that if you don't understand the backstory. If you don't know the details, you won't appreciate what Jesus did when he rode into Jerusalem. So this morning, I want to just show you very clearly God's rescue plan. Four things. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, the Bible says that God slaughtered an animal. He took the animal's skin and he created clothing for Adam and Eve. He did the first animal sacrifice. It was that animal's blood that covered Adam and Eve. And so we see God institutes the sacrificial system that throughout the entire Old Testament, we see the sacrifice of bulls and goats as a temporary, say temporary, Temporary covering. It didn't remove, but it temporarily covered their sins. Why? Because the Bible said in Hebrews 9.22 that it was only by blood that their sins were covered, that there was purification. So this system goes on for hundreds of years. We then see that God chooses a bloodline. He knew he was going to send Jesus. So he had to choose a family, a bloodline that Jesus Christ was going to be born into. He chooses a guy by the name of Abraham. He makes the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis chapter 15. And we begin to see this play out. A guy who had no kids. A guy who waited 25 years to have his first son at the age of 100. I don't know about you, but I'm not signing up for that. Like, no thank you. You know, when you're in your 40s and your last kids are 18, it's like, we're still young. We can still have fun. I don't want to have kids at 90 and 100. But that's what Abraham and Sarah did. Why? Because it was God's unexpected plan. Nobody would have ever expected it. 25 years they wait for that child. And then you see Abraham has Isaac and Isaac has Jacob. Jacob, the Bible says he wrestles with God and God changes his name. And his name changes to Israel. And all of a sudden we've got this big, massive amount of people that become known as the children of Israel in the land of Egypt. For 400 years, they're enslaved in Egypt. Then God rescues them out of Egypt. He brings them out. It was the third part of his plan. It's a picture of what he would do when Jesus brings us out of bondage and slavery to sin. And then the fourth part of his plan, after hundreds of years, is you see Jesus, God incarnate, in the flesh, God leaves his throne on high, comes in the form of a baby, Jesus lives a perfect, sinless, spotless life and then goes to the cross in our place. You see, in my mind, even as a kid, I used to think, why all the Old Testament? Like, why didn't we just jump to Jesus is the perfect, sinless, spotless sacrifice? Brings us back into relationship with God. We can now go for a cool walk in the evening with Jesus. We can have that conversation any time of day. You don't need to go to a high priest. You don't need to go into the Holy of Holies one time a year. But any time, day or night, night or day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can call upon the name of Jesus. You see, they couldn't do that in the Old Testament. Do you see what you have? But yet it all came in a very unexpected way. So this morning... On Palm Sunday, we're going to pick up in the book of Matthew. You can read about it in all four of the Gospels. But in the book of Matthew, chapter 21, we're going to see as Jesus begins this journey into Jerusalem, the Passion Week. Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. 
If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. This is the prophet Zechariah. And it says this, Say to daughter Zion, See your king comes to you gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So you see, hundreds of years prior to this event, God spoke to the heart of the prophet Zechariah and said, I want you to write this down because in many, 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 many years to come, this will be a confirmation in that moment that I have sent the Messiah. And so here we are in Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. This is the prophecy. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, to those Jews that were assembled together at this time of Passover, um, for those that were educated, were learned, understood the Jewish tradition, understood the, the writings of the prophets, when they saw Jesus coming in and riding on this, this donkey, they associated it with, many of them would have associated it with King David and King Solomon, kings of the past. Because when the kings were on a peaceful mission, they would come rolling into town on a donkey because the donkey represents a, a, a mission of an animal of peace. Now, if there was war, the, he'd come, come riding in on a war horse that was taller than all the other horses. And you would know, board up the house, hide the kids, trouble's coming. This is not good if the king comes riding in on a horse. But if the king comes in on a donkey, it, it would have been very similar to um, King Solomon when his inauguration happened, they paraded through the city and he was riding on a donkey and, and, and he was entering, he was taking all of Israel with him into a, an era of tremendous peace. And so for those that knew the prophecies and they saw Jesus riding in town through, this, uh, through, through town on this donkey, they associated that, okay, this, this is a messianic prophecy being fulfilled. So they recognized in that moment then, okay, then Jesus is the Messiah. He is the king of, of Israel, the one that has been prophesied of. And here he is, and he is going to usher us into an era of peace. And so they had this idea in their mind, now kind of role-playing out all, all the details of what this rescue plan should look like. But that's not how Jesus chose to rescue them. And in a moment, like we, as we began the message today, in just a flip of a switch, they turned their back on him and they lashed out to the very one that was trying to save them. But in Matthew 6 and verse 9, it says that the crowds, you know, here they are, they've picked up these palm branches, just like they did with Solomon's inauguration. And they went ahead of him and those that followed, they shouted, Hosanna, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And they were referencing this Old Testament prophecy. Recognizing that he was the Messiah. But that word Hosanna in the Hebrew means save now. Not just save us Lord please sometime really soon. It meant save now. Now, Hosanna. Hosanna means save. Na means now. Save now. How many times has that kind of been your prayer life? God, I want this and I want it now, right? We think that we grow out of that baby stage of, of just throwing ourselves on the floor and throwing a temper tantrum when we don't get we, what we want when we want it. But really, that's how a lot of us pray. Is God, I want this and I want it now, right? That's how we are. This is what the children of Israel were doing. They were saying, God, we want you to come. The Messiah, we want the Messiah to come and rescue us, and we want him to rescue us now. From what? They were living under the rule and the control of a tyrannical empire, the Roman Empire. They were oppressed politically, financially, physically, every way you can imagine, and they wanted out. They wanted to be set free. They wanted to be rescued, and Jesus was there to rescue them, and not only them, but all of us and all the other generations that would live for generations to come. He was there to rescue. He was there to save, but not in the way that they had expected. You know, when you actually study out names, it's so very interesting how names had such importance in the word of God. And Brad just said, Hosanna meant save now, but the word Jesus 
which they were saying over and over and over as he was there doing his ministry, he was a superstar. Jesus literally meant he shall save. This is future tense. Not save now as in Hosanna, which is what they were asking for, but Jesus' name, his very name meant he shall save, which was a future tense. He was going to save them. It was going to happen, but not in the way they expected. And so as you roll in on Palm Sunday, what you need to begin to understand is that the reason there was this large crowd of people there is because they were all there to celebrate a national holiday. You remember I said in that rescue mission plan that God established that when he brought the people out of the nation of of Egypt, out of bondage, he established a national holiday known as Passover. And Passover was one of the three feasts that everybody was required by law, by law, to go back to the capital city of Jerusalem and celebrate. And not just go back and celebrate, but there was very specific ways in which they were to celebrate Passover. And they had been doing it every year since they had been delivered from Egypt. So on Palm Sunday, when Jesus rides into Jerusalem, this is the 10th day. It is the day that they were to select the lamb. You can see when you go back and you read the Old Testament that it said that the first day of the, that the first month, Nisan, on the 10th day, they were to choose a lamb. And this lamb was to be sacrificed. This lamb was the temporary blood covering. And it was on that 10th day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem. And they believed in that moment, as Brad said, that he was establishing himself as king. And so they, they had their palm branches and they were singing his praises. Hosanna, Hosanna, save us now. And they're rallying behind him. Guys, we're talking over 2 million people that would have been in the city. The city streets packed. But then, guys, what you need to understand is it's on the 14th day that that Passover lamb every year was slaughtered. And it was only a few days later that this same crowd, when they saw Jesus was arrested, and they realized that Jesus was not going to rescue them in the same way they expected him to rescue them, the very same crowd changed their tone from Hosanna to crucify crucify. Why? Because you didn't do what we thought you were going to do. You didn't do it the way we wanted you to do it. The same crowd turned. And on the day of the 14th, while the lamb was there with the high priest staked at the temple, Jesus was taken outside of the town at nine o'clock in the morning, both being staked, Jesus to a cross, the lamb at the temple. Jesus taking his last breath at three o'clock in the afternoon while the lamb has its throat slit at three o'clock in the afternoon. Did anybody even remember John the Baptist seeing Jesus coming down to the Jordan River and saying, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, not a temporary covering, but a removal. He takes away the sin of the world. Why? Because in that moment, what they didn't understand, what they didn't expect is that Jesus was coming to be the once and for all spotless sinless sacrifice to take away their sins, to rescue them, not just out of the the titanical rule of the Roman Empire, but to rescue them from the bondage of sin that they had lived in all of these years. But they couldn't see it. They didn't understand. And I wonder how often today we are just like those people. We pray And we ask God to move in our life. And we ask him to do a certain thing. And when he doesn't do it the way we expect him to do it, we don't realize that maybe he's working something different. Maybe he's gonna do it a different way, a way that we don't expect. You know, it's only because we have the word of God that we get to see the rest of the story. If you were there and you traded places, many of us would have been in the same boat. But the question today is, do you trust? Do you trust God? Because that's really what it comes down to. They did not trust that the Messiah was who he said he was when all of a sudden in front of their eyes, it didn't look the way they expected it to look. 
He was going to save them, but not in the way they had planned. Within this Passover story, you see Jesus explain it in a very powerful way. And this really, for you and I, this paints a beautiful picture of how incredibly loving and sacrificial our God really is. In John chapter 12, verse 23, it said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And in verse 24, Jesus said, verily, very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. You know, Jesus knew exactly what was in store for him. He knew exactly what it would take in order to rescue you and me from our sins. He didn't have to do what he did. Do you realize that? By his own free will, he voluntarily gave himself up volunteered himself as a ransom sacrifice who was completely perfect and completely innocent and completely spotless because he was the only solution, the only possible solution for you and I to be set free from the sin that had cursed all of humanity and cursed our future. You and I had a home in hell. Let's say it that way. Our future was hell. And God said, not on my watch, not my people. If you ever doubt for one second how much God loves you, I want you to think about this passage of scripture. He knew that if he would just give his life and die a brutal death on the cross, that not only could you live, but all of humanity would have the opportunity to say yes to the name of Jesus to invite him into their hearts and he would free them and he would rescue them. But he had to do it in a way that we didn't expect. Do you know how much God loves you? Do you have any idea how much God loves you and the price that he paid so that you could make heaven your home? And yet, even after coming to Christ, so many of us continue down this path of sin as if God's grace had no value. We continue down this path of doing things and saying things and thinking things habitually that we know displeases God. We know that it separates us Him in our relationship with Him. And we just continue to do it as if what He did on the cross has absolutely no value. We should be a people who love God as much as he loves us. If that's even humanly possible, it's not. <laughs> but we should strive to love him like he loves us and to live in a way that proves it. Today, I, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for those of you that are joining us online today. And I just pray that, that we would recognize only, not only what he did and why he did it, but that we would recognize God is always, always, always working things together for our good if we would only just trust him. Just trust him. Do we walk by faith and not by sight. We can't walk by what we see. We have to walk by what we know, that God is faithful. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He is always working things together for your good. Even though you may not like the outcome, he is God and he is good. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for your word. So grateful for your son, Jesus, that you willingly allowed to die on the cross so that we could live. That wheat grain that withered up and died so that it could multiply and make a way possible for so many from generation to generation to generation to come for so many to be able to say yes to life and no to death the death that we deserved 
Today, God, we thank you for your grace. We are grateful for what you have done. We are so incredibly grateful for what you have done, God, and we thank you. We thank you, God. And Lord, forgive us in those moments when we question you. Not knowing what you are doing, thinking that we know what's best, thinking that we know what it should look like and how it should turn out. God, forgive us for not trusting you with all of our heart. Forgive us, God, for leaning on our own understanding and not acknowledging you and your will. Forgive us. Help us to trust you like we've never trusted you before. No matter what it looks like. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we have given you a very clear understanding of what the gospel is. We've explained to you why Jesus had to die and why sin separates us from a relationship with God and why you and I need Jesus more than anything else. So my question for you, whether you're watching online or you're in God's house today is, have you asked God to forgive you of your sins and have you invited Jesus into your heart? Have you taken advantage of this free gift of grace that he has extended to you? If you haven't, now is your chance. Now is the opportunity. Now is the moment where you can say yes to Jesus. You can say yes to grace. You can say yes to heaven, your forever home. You can do that by just saying, God, forgive me. I believe Jesus is the son of God and I confess him to be Lord of my life. So if you're watching online right now and you're ready to make this decision, would you just comment all in in the comment section below? And if you're in this room, we're going to pray together as a church. But before we do, would you just raise your hand so I can see who we're praying for this week and, and in this room this morning? You're saying yes to Jesus. You're saying yes to life change. You're saying yes to an eternity in heaven. Let's pray this prayer today. Father, I'm so sorry for my sins. Please forgive me. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus is the Son of God and it's only through Him I can find salvation. I confess today Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.